Today, I'm very excited because we have back with us a guest, Stel Bailey, who unfortunately we were not able to uh, have on last time we were there. Um, we had our show on, we had some technical difficulties. So we're changing things up a little bit today to make sure we get to talk to Stel. Don't wanna miss a word she has to say. Hey, Andrea, thank you for being on today. Hey, Michelle, thanks for good to see you. Uh, Michelle down in Florida. So, and you know, a lot of it actually has to do with Florida today. <clears throat> we are, are talking today about water. And water is one of those things that is a topic that people tend to take for granted. I mean, when they think about the water, they think about, uh, you know, fishing, illegal fishing. They think about uh, strains on the water supplies. But what a lot of people don't think about are the legal allowances of poisons and toxins into our everyday water that affects us in ways that haven't actually been fully determined and fully counted yet. So, uh, hey, uh, hey there, Coralie. Nice to see you. And hey, Coralie, I'm glad to see that you're on. Always nice to see you there. I know another uh, uh, very, very strong um, water warrior right there. So uh, hopefully everybody is getting a good signal and you're able to hear me okay and see me okay. Um, Stella and I tested this out a little bit earlier just to make sure. So what I wanted to do today is start out with uh, one of my favorite parts of the show always is a quote. So today's quote is going to be one that everybody here will probably recognize because I see a lot of very ego-conscious people. And it is this, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. From the Lorax, Dr. Seuss. And the reason that I bring this one up is because once we start to talk about water, we start to talk about contaminants and toxins inside of our water. And the problem is, is that uh, the, the polluters have very high, high, um, okay, good. Thanks, Crowley. Yeah, the polluters have a very high um, <clears throat> profile, whereas the people that fight back tend to be more on the local level. So, but it involves us throwing ourselves in the way and, and shaking things up on a local level. Hey, Paula, thanks for being on today. It's great to see you on here. Um, yeah, and you know, and that and that is the thing, just like the Lorax says, you know, uh, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is ever gonna get better, it's not. And it requires all of us to step in and try to affect change where and how we can. And what's great about Stell is, Stell has actually created a way to change how things run in the state and a way to advocate uh, on a bigger level. So it's going to be fantastic to be able to talk to her today and be able to interact. And, and, and you know, uh, for everybody that's just joining the show right now, uh, you can actually type into Facebook. We'll see it here in the studio. And then you can uh, ask Stell questions directly in. So we'll be uh, getting to Stell actually a little bit earlier than usual uh, on this show coming up. So, um, but what I wanted to do was to talk about, you know, I, again, when we come back to water, water is often not traced as a problematic chronic illness causing issue. It seems to always be underscored. And recently they found that out of a hundred thousand so uh, wells that they tested in California, all of them had what are called PFAS, which are forever chemicals. And these are forever chemicals that are toxic. So forever chemical means that if it gets into your body or it gets into the soil or the land, that it never, ever, ever will deteriorate or go away. So we have this kind of an issue um, that is facing everybody uh, all around the entire United States. And the problem is a lot of us are getting illnesses from the water, but it's very hard to trace it down because you have the corporations that are taking the water, using them for their processes and then spitting them back out into the public waterways. Then the public waterways go down and as they go down the river, the local communities will pull their local water supply, municipal water supplies from these rivers. So there's a whole bunch of guesswork involved. And there's a lot of aspects that allow these companies to do it legally. Recently, there's been very problematic because the, um, the, all the enforcement agencies have basically backed off, which means that any enforcement or any oversight that was occurring previously is no longer occurring. Uh, so we are in a situation right now 
where uh, really it comes back to that Lorax again, unless us step in, it will not change. And it's very complicated because you also have politicians on every level. And we're going to get to talk to Stella a little bit about this as well, because how do you affect change with all of these multi-levels working against you? You know, um, And today, really, we're going to focus mostly on Florida. Now, Florida, there's so many different water issues facing Florida. And one great thing is uh, Stella, um, she has a, a foundation called fight40.org. And fightforzero.org is all about tackling environmental issues and how they connect with health. Because a lot of the states and a lot of the larger companies do not want to connect their activities and us getting illnesses. You know, uh, I, when I moved to California, I didn't have any cancers. And after I got here, uh, about four years later, I was diagnosed Um and it grew rapidly. The tumors grew rapidly. And there was a lot of different factors. So I've never been able to fully know exactly what it was. I worked in an old hospital when I worked on the TV show Scrubs. We worked in an old hospital and we were uh, surrounded by a lot of old elements that probably shouldn't have been there, um, like mercury on the ground and things like that. So a lot of bad elements. We were also, you know, plus I surf uh, and who knows what's in that water. Plus, we, as we just found out, Los Angeles has so many PFAS contaminants that uh, the water itself is poisoned here. So, you know, that we're who knows exactly where it came from. Plus, here in California, they uh, put signs up everywhere that say, caution, this building is known to cause cancer. And they do that instead of making the landlords take the buildings down and rebuild them with safer uh, things they they change the law here in California that all they have to do is just warn people. So, you know, that it's it's a really weird kind of complicated place to navigate. Um, and the problem is is that a lot of us are paying the price with our sicknesses. You know, cancer rates internationally have risen over thirteen percent since the late nineteen seventies. So that's really not that long. Um, and they have just consistently risen and risen and risen internationally. And I think what's happening in Florida is the same as what's happening in every place around the world is that uh, they, are, they are being poisoned by the very companies that surround their public waterways and their public lands. Hey, Camilla, thanks for being on today. Appreciate you being here. It's really nice to see everybody. I, I hope uh, you know, this new, uh, this new pattern is, is, this new system seems to be working well. I'm excited because once we get Stell in, we can start to interview her, uh, then we'll really be able to uh, make sure that this, this system works well. Um, but, you know, I was really excited. I was so bummed last week when we were not able to talk to her because she is one of my personal inspirations. Um, you know, she's somebody that has fought cancer, that has beat cancer, and to make sure that other families don't experience what she's going through, she is fighting and fighting and fighting to have this connection between the environment and our illnesses understood and tracked. And there's a couple of incredible ways. I don't want to give away too much, but you know, one thing that she did start was a cancer index, uh, which is a, a private uh, place where people can submit you know, the different, uh, whatever they have, the diagnosis, they can, you know, submit the symptoms and they have a private database that's able to track all of these issues. And that's what's missing right now. You know, there is no connection. And, you know, my, my guess personally is just that because once the companies, if, if they're, if we're able to connect companies pollution to our health, then I think it opens them for a lot of lawsuits. So I think the health industry in general is very hesitant to attach it too often. And we also see that in Florida, where a lot of people are getting sick. Now, when I talk about Florida, I'm not trying to single them out, but uh, it's fascinating to know that Florida has the second high. Now, this is according to the Florida Health website itself. Florida has the second highest cancer burden in the entire nation. And as of 2011, cancer is the leading cause of death in Florida, surpassing heart disease. Now, there's all these rises in cancer out there, and yet the state does not appear to be having any proactive fashion for that. And that is where people like Stell come in because she's ready. She is putting together the information, collecting it, and trying to understand the connections and understanding where 
the concentrations are. And those are what we call cancer clusters, where the cancer clusters are areas where they find an abnormally large amount of cancer diagnosis in the same small area. So Stell works really hard to track multiple types of issues that are going on right now throughout Florida. And I think we can learn a lot from her on how to do it in our hometown, plus how to do it with a bigger voice. So what I'd like to do now is bring Stell on here. Let's see how, let's see how everything goes today. <laughs> here we go. Hey, Stell. Hi, can everybody hear me this time? <laughs> let's see. I can hear you. I'm hoping everybody else is good. We're going to wait for our comments here. And thank you for being back on. Thank you. I really for appreciate it. Ah. <laughs> thank you for right. having me. <laughs> so let's see. Can everybody hear Stell before we, uh, before we start diving into all the interesting stuff. All right, Jeff says yes. Yay. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. Now, let me just try this here. Um, okay. Okay, so here we go. Uh, well, we were just covering a little bit about the basic overall issue that's happening. But Stell, what I'd like to do is just start from the very beginning. And first of all, how did you get involved in tracking this? You know, what, what brought you to where you are now? Okay, um, so in 2013, uh, my family, uh, cancer became a part of my family's life. So in the beginning of 2013, our uncle who lived with us, he's not blood related, he was married into the family. He was diagnosed with cancer and passed away not too long after he was diagnosed because he caught it very late. <laughs> then a few months later, my our family dog actually ended up with cancer. Um, then three months later, my little brother at the age of 21 got Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. And then three months later, I got Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. And then my dad was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is also a cancer. He got the worst of all of us with the cancer because his was a lifelong diagnosis. So that's, uh, uh, you know, I didn't think anything of it when my uncle got it or when my family dog got it. And I always bring up the dog um, just because, you know, everybody wants to bring up the genetic aspect of it. And they're like, well, it must run in your family. Mm -hmm. And um, an interesting fact is that our case was so unique. We were invited to do genetic testing and they found no mutating genes. Uh, we were able to travel across the country and see numerous specialists across the country. And every single one of them said, where did you grow up? Hmm. That was always a number one question. Where did you grow up? Because, you know, and they would say, did you grow up, you know, near this? Was there something going on? And, and you know, do you know anybody else? And so that kind of spearheaded a, a, a movement within me. I'm like, I need to figure out what's going on here, because obviously all of these specialists and these oncologists and these doctors and these experts are telling me something is wrong. And it made me want to start crowdsourcing cancer information in my area to begin with. Now we're crowdsourcing across the state of Florida. But when I first started, it just started with me saying, I'm going to crowdsource in Bavard County where I grew up um, mm -hmm. to see if I know anybody or if there's more people like us. And it turned out there were lots more like us, a lot more. So many stories that were similar to ours, um, you know, same dynamic with the families being diagnosed one after another, lots of childhood cancers. So that's what started the whole crowdsourcing um, efforts. Mm -hmm. And then we started mapping and kind of putting two and two together and the water quality issues and other environmental issues across the state of Florida. So it really um, I, I just became so passionate about making a change because, as you know, Eric, going through cancer is difficult. It is not an easy journey. Um, you know, sitting in that chair, losing all your hair, losing your eyebrows, um, just being completely sick, having to, you know, basically fight for your life. And then to actually be a caregiver on top of that um, to numerous family members and watching them go through the similar things. I just think it really gave me the strength and, and the passion and the desire and the determination to really go after um, this so that other families and, um, you know, parents and daughters and, and sons and brothers don't have to go through what my family went through. So that's basically how I got into this and started. I started researching. I think we all kind of get into it the same way. Um, you know, just really digging deep into the issues, the history, going through archived newspapers, um, 
and just I actually went door to door in a lot of neighborhoods talking to neighbors because I think that's really beneficial. A lot of people just stay online, but when you actually go out and sit on somebody's porch and have a real one on one conversation with them, you you tend to learn so much more. Yeah. Through that's that. Good. So, so true. <laughs> You know what? I, I love it. I mean, you're very passionate. And I understand that because, you know, you're on a mission and it's hard for people to understand. I think that don't have cancer when they hear that we have cancer or that we fought cancer, they will automatically, uh, in a sense, give us a sort of a victim hood uh, to it. But I, you know, I feel and, and you know, I, I feel like it sort of, in a sense, focused a mission for me. Uh, and, and I like what you say, because my feeling is if there's any way to prevent any of these cancers that we, it's our obligation as a society to do that, you know, and, um, you know, and I, I think it's really important that that has become your mission, you know, but I, yeah, I, I wanted to say that, you know, it's like with cancer, it, it has been, of course, the worst thing in the world that's ever happened, but uh, it's really impressive that you've taken something positive out of it. Yeah. It ended up being the best thing that ever happened in my life, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thankful. And I, I even wrote a letter to cancer and said, thank you. Thank you for putting me through this. It, it taught me who my real friends were. It taught me to value different things in life. And it taught me humanity and, and you know, to take on these issues and, and to do it bold and, and fear, fearlessly without any fear to just, you know, trust in my faith and, and go for it. And I just, like you said, you know, some people will look at it cause they, they see you just so sick. you got the sick eyes, you're puking, you, yeah. you know, and they look at, Oh my God, I feel so bad. They're so sick. They're weak. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, all the cancer patients and, and the cancer survivors that I have met in my life are some of the strongest people I've ever met. So <laughs> So well said. Yeah, very true. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you've suddenly, you've seen this cancer, you know, something weird is happening. You guys have taken the blood test. So now that you start to crowdsource, what kind of reaction do you get? Are, are, I mean, how, how is it? I know it's very difficult generally starting a project people have never thought about doing, which I, you know, is amazing that you did. So how, how do people receive that? So I began in 2014, the moment that I was told you're in remission, that's when I created this, this Facebook group. And I'm like, Hey, does anybody here have cancer? Do you know anybody with cancer? And, um, I wasn't expecting it to grow the way that it did. It, it grew really, really fast. Um, and so I started then. And when I first began and I, every time I would see a post about water, you know, I was seeing interesting posts on social media about, you know, people getting sick after drinking their water and bacterial bacteria levels and things like that. And so I would mention, you know, I would always say, hey, has anybody here been sick? Have they had cancer, autoimmune disease? I'm collecting information. And I would get a lot of criticism in the beginning. Now I don't get it as much, but in the beginning, I think it was just so new. And a lot of people were like, you're just crazy. You know, the water's fine. You just want to blame your cancer on something. You know, everybody gets cancer. It runs in your family. And, you know, you hear all these excuses and you hear it over and over. And I just, there was something within me. I ignored it all, the criticism and everything. And I just pushed forward because I knew, I just knew in my heart that something was wrong, um, especially in my hometown. So I, I just kept going, I kept pushing. And then in 2018, I met an amazing oncologist who grew up in Satellite Beach. And she said to me, you're collecting data too. And I said, yeah. And I guess she had just started collecting her um, high school classmates because she was noticing that they were all getting rare cancers at a young age too. And so I said, I'm willing to share my data. And she said, can you make a group like your group specifically for this area? So we kind of collaborated on that. And then she made the decision to go to the news because she said, this is just something's not right here. So 2018 is when things really just took off for everything, because um, that's when we were able to bring the awareness and we were able to push for testing. And that's when we saw the Department of Defense's um, their report come out about PFAS contamination. And we mm -hmm. realized, oh, my gosh, in Bavard County. Uh, we have PFAS contamination at Patrick Air Force Base, Kennedy Space Center, and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So that's like surrounding, like we've got three points 
um, you know, sources where they use firefighting foam and it gets into our water. Hmm. And then we, I stumbled upon another test from Dr. Bowden. Um, he's with the University of Florida where they tested wildlife and they tested it in their blood and they found it there. So that was really interesting in the Indian River Lagoon. Wow. So it, so it's getting into seeping into all of the surrounding nature and mm -hmm. Yeah, now that's, you know, it's amazing you say that because I, the place I would never guess that would be an unsafe work environment would be like a, an Air Force base or the, you know, like NASA area. Um, so you found that on bases they have this, this issue. Is it because they, they use an excessive amount of the type especially, of chemical? Especially you, Air Force bases. Hmm. Do they have uh, ways that they try to mitigate it going out or is it sort of something that they have not uh, addressed yet? Um, I think they're just now kind of addressing it because there's been so much um, push on it. I know that they're actually trying to phase out the, the PFAS uh, chemical, but uh, before, see, this is an interesting detail about the, the Department of Defense. Uh, there's paperwork that shows that they knew that this chemical was potentially dangerous and they never you know, said anything and they continued to use it. So, <laughs> you know, and, and it really, it's bothersome for me because you know, you've got all these military families, servicemen and their and women that live on base um, and are being exposed to these these contaminants. And those aren't the only contaminants that we're finding that are on bases. We're finding that there's a lot of issues with the military bases in general when it comes to contamination. You can look at Fort Lejeune, um, I think it is, it's or Camp Lejeune, I'm sorry, uh, where they had serious contamination issues in their drinking water. And so, um, you know, you look at historical documentation. That's one of the things that we did. We looked at archived newspapers. And what's interesting about our area is, well, at least Satellite Beach, um, in South Patrick Shores, they have a, a really <laughs> an interesting history. In the 1990s, they had a cancer cluster investigation, the same exact cancer that my brother and I had, Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hmm. They found nearly 40 cases of it in just this small little area. I mean, it was within a few blocks of each other that, that all of these people came down. And that's not the only cancer that, that I, there's a couple people that I know that had other rare cancers like bone cancer that went to that high school. So, you know, um, they determined that it was caused by a virus. The Department of Health said it was huh. caused by a virus. A they, virus. Also said, yeah, they also said St. Lucie County, um, their cancer cluster was, uh, it was not exactly a virus, but it was something similar to that. Hmm. So we find that very interesting that they're, they're trying to blame it on a virus in the 90s. But we did um, push for, with that data that we collected, we pushed for a cancer cluster investigation. And they did find that there were higher rates of certain cancers in, in two zip codes that they studied. And that is, I mean, that, that's, that's a very high, uh, to have it in those type of small areas, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's great. Now, have you found more cancer clusters than you imagine? I mean, most people have never even heard of a cancer cluster. Yeah. Uh, much right. less be surrounded. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's how we were able to bring on more directors onto Fight for Zero because, um, you know, we've met some amazing people that have been working on this even longer than, than myself. You know, there's, there's a woman named Cheryl, she lost her sister um, and they're dealing with like a high school potential cancer cluster situation and they're still waiting on their study to come back from the Department of Health. Um, so there's a lot of similar issues. There's another one in St. Lucie County. We know that the acreage, they actually designated them a cancer cluster and we're actually doing an investigation with the Department of Health, um, not with, but on the Department of Health right now, trying to really break down, you know, their numbers versus our numbers and and all the because we're finding so many inconsistencies with the data and the numbers and how they do these studies across the state it's very interesting because they did our study different from the, how they did st lucy's study how they did manatee county's study how they're doing other studies and um, we actually took that to Tallahassee last year and, and met with the governor's team and told him, you know, there's inconsistencies here and something's wrong with the Department of Health's data. And so they never got back to us. We tried to follow up on numerous mm -hmm. occasions, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, you know, the, the, the Department of Health, it just sounds like a place that's meant to, you know, run out and defend the citizens at, at a moment's notice. 
Um, but it sounds like they, that's not the reaction that you got at all from them. No, it just seems it seems like they're really in the interest of the state, hmm. really, um, and and what they are trying to accomplish. I, you know, we, we just, you know, we're just trying to understand, and and we never, our goal was never to actually get designated as a cancer cluster. I think. You know, at the end of the day, these communities, they want to be acknowledged. They want to be acknowledged that, hey, we see that there's documentation that shows that there's contamination and there's a potential, you know, um, issue. And for me, it has always been about saving lives. And a part of that is prevention, you know, and early detection. And if people aren't aware and they're not, you know, they don't know what's going on, they're not going to go to a doctor and say, hey, I may have been exposed to these chemicals. I'm a little worried. I've had some of these symptoms and, and be able to get that early detection because early detection saves lives, especially when it comes to certain cancers. Well said, yes. Yeah. That, and that is something that if they're not acknowledging the problem, then they're not gonna think in the preventative way to even address it in a, in a proper fashion. Right. You know, that, uh, that's, you know, and, and it's amazing to me that with the rise of cancer so much and since 2011, it being the number one cause of death in Florida, that they would not be a little bit more, um, you know, active in helping. But it's at least it's good to know that there are politicians that you can go to that are open to listen, and these are the people that can maybe make some changes. Yes. You know, would. Yes. You know, um, and now Coralie says, um, and now Coralie, I believe you used to work on Superfund cleanups, I believe, for the EPA. And uh, Coralie, now then, and, and we'll talk about Superfunds also because that's another thing that uh, Fight for Zero tracks are the Superfund sites, um, as well as a few other areas. Um, my mom says hi. <laughs> There's a hi, hi mom. <laughs> and uh, Andrea says silence is an answer too. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. That's exactly it. Uh, when the state and the Department of Health come back and they're quiet about it, that means they're complicit. Um, now, even before we get into ways that you're finding the difficulties to make the change, for people that are just tuning in right now, we're talking a little bit about PFAS and some other stuff, but just so that everybody knows, um, you know, what exactly is it? And, and aside from PFAS, you know, what, what kind of elements are you finding in the water and what sort of dangers, you know, um, should, can people understand that that might pose to them? Um, okay, so PFAS is, um, we call it a forever chemical. You'll, you'll hear us say, you know, it's a forever chemical because it doesn't break down in the environment and it takes a long time to go out of your 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 system, like eight years. Um, I always want to refer to uh, the new movie that came out, um, Dark Waters. If oh, yeah. anybody's watched it, I think it really gives you a lot of insight into the company that created these really dangerous chemicals and how they hid it for so long. They knew about the health effects and they hid it for so long. And, you know, it's it's based on a lawyer. Um, he's he's an amazing person. I was able to meet him in Washington D.C. Uh, and he just he worked so hard um, to really get this eight year study done um, on the health effects of it. And so you've got PFOA and PFOS. You'll you'll hear that too. You'll hear PFAS, Forever Chemicals, PFOA, PFOS, um, perfluorinated compounds. And so it doesn't, it takes forever to break down in, in the environment and that's really dangerous in itself. Um, mm -hmm. But for, for our health, um, it's been connected to several health issues. And um, I can't think of the exact things off the top of my head, but there's so many and there's so many communities affected by it. And if it's, you know, if you're drinking this stuff, it's, it's really bad. It's not good. It does not break down in your body. There's been many communities that have done blood testing that have found high amounts of it um even children there was a project done where children were holding up their number their pfoa and pfos number um it's wow. it's yeah it's it's really not good and and i know that it's not just in our area that we're finding pfas it's it's all over i know that down south they had it in the actual drinking water there's been wells that that have had it in there um there are two I don't know if they're pending still. I have to, you know, check up on it. But we did get there's two legislation uh, bills in Tallahassee right now that have to do with PFAS, and we've posted that. But um, I can put it in the comments later and and just really break it down because uh, I one of them was for the wells. Anybody that had contaminated wells that they could get, um, you know, something some help with that. I know that filtration systems are being 
proposed in Washington, D.C. So there, there's solutions coming to the table. And I think it's really important that we all look at the realistic solutions and really try you know, to push for those because we can stay online all day and talk about it. But if we're not actually taking action and putting solutions on the table in front of these politicians, you know, um, their pens and, you know, they, they're not going to they don't know they're busy. You know, politicians are super, super busy. So we have to educate them on these issues. That's it. You, go, you know, that is that, that's that's a big thing is people don't they assume that they're keep up on these things, you know, and they're yeah. just yeah, they don't know that. So it's important that we have a voice. And I think a lot of times people feel that they're stuck. You know, there is no voice. They have no way. How are we going to stop? Uh, DuPont, you know, since we're talking about PFAS, you know, um, we talk about nonstick coating, uh, which they supposedly stopped and then, but then started using a different version of the same thing. Uh, I understand yeah. it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is, you know, so, you know, that's something that people can sort of relate to. And as I understand, you know, that explains also that the PFAS are worldwide, you know, after being used in nonstick chemicals for your Teflon, uh, Scotchgard, um, you know, preventing the stains from going. I remember spraying that stuff on couches, like as a kid, you know, yeah. no abandon, you know, and it's crazy now that they've come back to understand uh, how dangerous that is, um, you know, for us it, worldwide. What PFAS reminds me of, I mean, we have so many chemicals and contaminants, hmm. you know, but we're repeating history here, if you think about it, because if you've ever heard of the Radium Girls, that, that story fascinates hmm. me, the Radium Girls story, where, you know, they used radium and they put them in the clocks for the military and they were licking the paintbrushes and then their faces, basically, they started getting tumors in their faces and they started, you know, you have to look it up if you have not, you know, heard about this Radium Girls, but they basically learned that this chemical, and by the time they learned that it was dangerous, it was in beauty products and all over the world. And this is exactly what they did with this perfluorinated compound is, you know, they just released it into everything, firefighters, clothing, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, the Teflon pans, like you said, we're cooking with that. So just imagine, you know, we're, we're ingesting this stuff. So I really, truly believe that we need to be testing these chemicals before they're even put out you know, to, to the public, it's, it's a risk to our health. And to find out decades later that they're extremely dangerous after people have already gotten sick is, um, it's just, I, I don't even know the word for it, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it makes us like their clinical study, you know, and, and we become their lab rats for the 20 year version of, of what happens. You know, like we, well, I've seen those pro um, DDT, commercials, you know, like the government made back in the day. And the yeah. guy sprays the DDT into the, the milk and, you know, eats it with his cereal and stuff. And, it, and it's crazy, you know, and the radium girls. And if people are not familiar with them, definitely make sure to Google yeah. them. It's a fascinating story. Um, you know, the way that they used to make contact with these chemicals back then was crazy. I remember reading about uh, Fossey Jaw from uh, Phosphate, that a lot of the kids that worked in the mines um, would get these giant growths um, and it became known as Fossey Jaw. And uh, phosphate was the original chemical used for everybody's just striking matches. So, you know, people are exposing themselves to like this, uh, basically this white phosphorus, you know, uh, without even knowing it. Um, and that's, that's the big problem is the secret of not knowing the health effects and, and allowing us to have access to it and continuing to permit it. Uh, I just real fast, I want to say Jeff uh, has a question. He says, didn't the schools Beachside and Brevard come back to positive for these chemicals two years ago in the drinking water. Yes, so you know, there's thousands of chemicals under this the PFAS chemicals, and one of the chemi chemicals that came back on, um, they tested the beachside fountains, drinking water fountains in the schools because we really pushed for that because they weren't testing drinking water; they were only testing groundwater. And PFBA came back, um, and I know there's a toxicology. We have toxicologist um, books and things that actually talk about PFBA and it causes thyroid issues and other health issues. So, um, you know, they still haven't, from from my knowledge, they still have not uh, made it any kind of effort to put filtration system within those schools. And, right. you know, I could go on about the schools and, and <laughs> that subject because we did a whole project last year where we um, did public record requests for all 67 counties in the state of Florida to see who was testing their water in the schools. and 
it was really disappointing some of the responses we got back um you know because we're like we know there's lead and other issues in these in these you know water fountains and if you're not testing them or or in your kitchens and you're getting you're feeding our kids spend how much time at these schools a day you mm -hmm. know what i mean so um and it was just an interesting project that we did because we really wanted to dig deep and see who was knowledgeable. And we did have a few people reach out to us, some politicians, and we always love that when they reach out to us and they want to collaborate and they want to work together and, you know, give us information and say, hey, we do have this problem. Is there any way we could, you know, discuss it and get some feedback? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. See, and that's, that, that is really, and now that's one of the things I want to talk about because on the local level, it's hard for people to get answers. And so anybody that is having a local water issue or questions about your water, I encourage you to go to fightforzero.org and contact them because they're interactive, they work nationwide, and they know about how everything should be coming together and also what limits you can work with and how to go about trying to make change. And also, I encourage everybody while we have Stell on, uh, I don't have to be the only one asking her questions. So if anybody has questions, please, Feel free to type them in because she's a tremendous resource. Um, Stell, one thing I wanted to talk about for people to understand is the inconsistency in the concept of what the proper limits are for some of these um, chemicals. Now, you know, federally, some of them have no limits. Some of them have. Uh, one thing I find interesting is um, that uh, you know, radiation. Uh, the the EPA, the the federal level, says any radiation. Uh, will actually nullify, if you're near a radioactive area, it actually nullifies your chance of getting a USDA status because you're not able to earn organic status because you are near radiation. Any exposure is considered dangerous. Um, in Florida, <laughs> they've got a different law. So, I, you know, uh, what, what have you found out to, to be that? And how can you talk about that slippery slope there? Where I, I don't even know where to start with safety <laughs> limits. I can just give an example right right now about PFAS, for instance. We've got mm. other states like Michigan that, you know, the state decided to, to make their own safety limits, you know, um, and Florida doesn't have a safety limit set for PFAS. So when we do find these chemicals, they say, well, we don't have a safety limit, so there's nothing we can do. There's nothing to remediate. There's, you know, there's nothing we can do. We don't have a safety limit. And it's something that we constantly bring up. Um, you know, they'll test for it and they find it and like, oh, well, there's no safety limit. You know, the EPA has a 70 parts per, per trillion um, safety limit, but the state of Florida does not right now as, you know, as it stands. But as far as other chemicals, you'll, you'll notice the same kind of trend where they say, well, you know, um, it's it's below this X amount, whether it's your drinking water, your groundwater. They say it's below this X amount. <laughs> so you're safe. Jeez. And that's why that's where I came up with the name fight for zero, because I was at a, at a city council meeting and, you know, I'm standing at the podium and, you know, I'm, I'm bringing up how this PFEA was found in children's drinking water at schools. And, um, you know, they pretty much came back with, well, there's, you know, it's safe because it's under the limit. And I said, there is no safety limit. So how can you say it's safe if there's no safety limit set? And, um, you know, the, it, I finally said it should be zero. Why are we not striving for zero? And that's why we say fight for zero. We want to strive to get as close to zero as possible when it comes to these dangerous and harmful contaminants. It doesn't have to be just PFAS. There's so many out there. We should be striving to get as close to zero as possible. And I don't understand why we are not trying to get as close to zero as possible. I mean, this is human health we're talking about. And not just that, our wildlife is also struggling because of, because of these contaminants. And basically we're, we're being polluted and Florida has this big welcome sign saying, welcome polluters, come to our state. You can dump X amount of chemicals in the water is what is basically what's happening. That's, and you know, that's, that's it. That is, that is true down there. I mean, you know, when, when you take an example like Mosaic who only has to report their pH of the, their outfalls, so the water that they take in, they add all this radiation, they add in, you know, mercury, lead, polonium, chromium, all the arsenic, all the goodies that lead to childhood cancer rates. And the only thing they have to report is their pH level. And it's crazy. Um, I see Molly is on, uh, Molly uh, Bowen is on there, who's another water warrior with Nosaic. 
And I know Molly has been very active in trying to test for uh, their local areas, including elementary schools. And Molly found excessive levels in the elementary schools, um, but yet a sense of apathy from everybody in the town and a sense of apathy from all the officials because uh, they have a new level that they've invented that's, you know, in their mind, what is safe, but it's not the proper exposure for children. Um, let's see, Michelle Fuller says, had a county test our water. They tested for chlorine only, which is equal to my pool water. He said, well, it might smell bad, but it's safe and left. That's that's nuts. Um, now, that's, now, Michelle, are you on well water or are you on um, regular water? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, Heather... Lynn is also on, who's another amazing water activist and has worked a lot uh, up in Pennsylvania and some other areas with leftover uh, contaminants that are left in the ground and that go through the water as well, um, as well as a uh, um, standing rock. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll well. notice with your drinking water, you know, mm. I, I've even tested my own drinking water with a chlorine kit and it's tested higher than what's in my pool. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's you know that that's what i saw in molly's test too from the the elementary schools was uh off the charts chlorine levels and i, I understand they use that as like a all around scrub for uh for for water you know water management companies use that um heather says the chlorine is a tthm and it causes cancer and birth defects don harrell yeah. says fight for zero I like that and uh michelle no county water uh michelle had her county water tested and dad has multiple myeloma um, from the water. Amazing, you know. Now, Estelle, the other thing that you mentioned that I just want to go back to real fast was that there were some well water tests. And some people like me that live in L.A. are not familiar so much with the people that are on well water, say, versus it. So what does it mean that they were able to find these in well water? Well, so what they say is like your well water is basically what you use to irrigate your lawns and, you know, people water their lawns with it. And, you know, so it's different than your drinking water, which, you know, it, it's not being supplied by the well water. You've got deep wells and you've got shallow wells. Um, that's always important. We've learned that through our testing and everything. Um, so, you know, it's still just as important to me if there's contaminants found in the well water, um, you know, because if you think about it, these contaminants, if you're watering your fruit trees or your vegetables, it's uptaking into that and you're eating it then. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you'll always hear officials and, and, and other people say, well, we don't drink well water. We don't drink groundwater. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was young, I drank straight out of my hose, which was well water. Sure. So, and not to mention a lot of people that go camping, what do you think you're drinking from? Probably well water. There you go. So there's little, and but I mean, this is a good time to bring up uh, like accumulative of effects too. Like, you know, another thing that people don't understand is these chemicals. Like something as simple as chlorine. Think about it. Drinking one cup probably isn't going to hurt you, right? But think about it building up every time you drink it throughout the years. Now you're five mm -hmm. years old. Now you're six years old. Now you're eight years old. Now you're you know ten years old. And, you know, some of our genetics can't handle that. And next thing you know, you have an autoimmune disease. Some, you know, whether it's thyroid mm. disease or your, your, your immune system is just um, completely shot. And then you then many years later, possibly cancer. Um, for instance, there's a latency period. Somebody brought it up in the comments. Yeah. And that latency period is about 15 to 20 years. So it builds up. And it builds up and that's why you see these wow. clusters pop up in about 15 20 years and like you'll see you know 54 graduates from satellite high school got cancer in the last you know uh recently i want to say in the last five years we've collected so much data but so that that's a good point to bring up about the latency period because it doesn't you know a lot of people look at it as like well it doesn't harm me you know i i drink this tap water all the time and it's like, well, it's, it builds up over time and we're most worried about children. You know what I mean? Because they're the most vulnerable mm -hmm. to, you know, as they grow up, if they're continuously drinking this, I mean, you, you, they could 16, 18, my brother at 21 was diagnosed at 21. I was in my twenties when I was diagnosed. There's a lot of young people being diagnosed in Florida and they're lifelong residents. Cause that's another thing that I hear like, well, are they even from Florida? Yeah, they're lifelong residents getting diagnosed. So, yeah, and and yeah, how can they how can they even pretend that it's genetic when it's everybody around a specific 
area. Uh, you know, in Florida, I, I, other good examples that, you know, people can check out is, uh, I think it's Oak Bridge, is the community in Lakeland that has sued because uh, the community itself uh, all got cancer. A lot of people got cancer once they moved in there. Um, you know, I know I spoke to somebody in a place called Fuller Heights, uh, where 11 out of, I think, 60 houses uh, all got cases of cancer uh, all around the same time. Uh -huh. after a yeah, well injection, uh, deep injection well was was started right near the communities. So, you know, it, it's it's incredible, um, you know, and do you think, here's the thing, how do we move forward though? Do you think there's a way that the companies can work with us um, to, to, to move in a safe direction or, you know, how, how do you think we can? Um, the, the companies that are polluting? Or yeah, the yeah. Unfortunately, the <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the causes. <laughs> uh -huh. I mean, maybe stop polluting to begin with. Maybe we can <laughs> start there. And you stop dumping stuff in the water. <laughs> you might have it not have an issue if you just stop. But um, <laughs> you know, to recognize that these chemicals are dangerous and 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 to take it seriously and. I, you know, I, I never understood why these companies hide it for so long and they allow it to go on for so long. DuPont is the perfect example of that, mm -hmm. you know, where they knew their workers, there was something weird going on. There were birth defects and, you know, a lot of their workers were coming down sick. And then they started having these internal, you know, health investigations. And sometimes I wonder if maybe they just get, you know, so, they dig themselves so deep of a hole mm -hmm. that they can't get themselves out because, you know, they, they, found out that is going on. They let it go on for so long. But, um, you know, I don't know these, these, that needs to stop. You know, this is human lives at risk and the hiding needs to stop. The lying needs to stop The you know, um, take it seriously. Like I, I just, I don't really have an answer for, for the corporations really other than, you know, just stop doing it and take our health seriously. You know, um, it, it you're killing people at the end of the day, it's negligence. And and that's what I was gonna ask about as well, because you know, a lot of people that work in conservation or even like myself, I don't always work with the human toll that these types of, of issues uh, take. And you do, uh, I know I watched, I, I read recently one of your posts, um, you know, where somebody had called you and shared their experience. And as somebody that has cancer, you know, uh, for anybody out there that has an experience, it's very isolating. Even if if somebody is is wants to be there for you, um, it's isolating and it's it's hard. And sometimes you can only actually talk to other people that have it. Mm -hmm. Sort of about the the um, you know where you're coming from uh, with it. So you know that's why you know it really hit me, Stell, when you put the post up that you know people have been able to connect and then not only find um, a human connection but also a way to move forward with hope. And I think that that's something that us as a cancer group haven't had in a long time. And it's something that you're offering with your group. Yeah. Um, I, and, and, you know, I love that community that we've built because yeah. it's the cancer survivors and patients, like we've all got each other's back. And I love that about our groups, you know, like, you know, don't mess with my cancer, you know, friend over here. But <laughs> What's really amazing is that we've got the families and the friends now getting involved of those cancer patients. And it feels so great. Just like I said, just acknowledge the people that have been through it. And, you know, um, I, I love my community that I, you know, we've, we've all just come together. And like you said, we can reach out to each other day or night. Um, you know, I've, I've had people call me and say, you know, I just survived cancer, but is it normal for me to feel this guilt? And I'm like, Absolutely, it is. <laughs> you know, it took me years to find normalcy again after I went through cancer, and I'm. It, you'll never be normal again. There's a new normal, and that's okay. Embrace it because you know now we've we've gone through something so traumatic that we can become who we really want to be without the world telling us who who we need to be. And you need to just embrace that. And I I just love you know being there for them, and I'm constantly on calls. You know all through the week and and having and having the friends and the family and the communities there and supporting as well um even though they haven't been through it that's mm -hmm. important too that's yeah. just as important because they may not understand the battle 
but they understand that it, it, it it's a hard battle. And I think that's really important to people too. It's true. And they often do get overlooked. You know, very often the person that's standing next to you the whole time that's holding you up, that, you know, keeps, keeps picking you up when you fall, uh, that person tends to be overlooked because, you know, whatever's happening to you is always, you know, pretty extreme. So <laughs> it, it is a good point. You know, a lot of times the caregivers do get overlooked and, um, you know, and it's, it's important and it's crazy the amount of cancers there are in today's world. Um, you know, now I, you know, I, 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 have you found, I don't want to ask anything too specific about, about your information that you've crowdsourced, but have you found particular cancers pop up as the most common or does it seem to sort of be like hybrid cancers or newer? I mean, what, what kind of overall do you? Well, I'll go through this because we collect so much. I mean, we're not just doing cancer, we're doing autoimmune disease. So I want to first start off with ALS because we do see clusters of ALS, um, you know, throughout the state. So mm -hmm. that's one of them. Um, as far as cancer goes in particular, liver cancer, mm -hmm. uh, the blood cancers, leukemia, we see a lot of leukemia, high rates of leukemia. Um, what else? Breast cancer. Breast cancer mm -hmm. is a big one. And we've been trying to work with other networks that, you know, there's, they specialize in the breast cancer awareness and, you know, trying to bring awareness to the potential for, because what's really unique about what we've collected is it's a lot of young people getting breast cancer, like unheard of, you know, diagnoses, like 21 getting a breast cancer that most people maybe in their late fifties or sixties get. Um, it's, it's really yeah. interesting, you know? Um, but those are probably some of the main, I, I, we're, we're still working on really going through all that because what we have to do is we have to go through all of it and call and verify. It's a lot of tedious work and a lot of working with data. And then eventually we want to put it on a map, you know, not to where people can see where the homes are, but they can get a general idea if there's like heavy right. spots of, you know what I mean, with certain dates. And we've got a lot, you know, we're trying to work on when it comes to bringing that data. But the data has helped us a lot as far as getting you know, cancer assessments mm -hmm. in the state of Florida, also um, by taking it to the p politicians and kind of breaking it down for them, what we've collected and working with professionals like oncologists and doctors and universities. So, you know, that's what the data is used for when, when we're collecting it. We're just trying to get answers and a better picture. Cause I feel like once we get a picture of what's going on, it's so much more clear than just talking about it. Like we wanted to put it into action so we could show people like, look at, look at what we have right now. And um, it's just incredible the, the, the amount of people and it's all self-reported. So yeah. you go on the website, you fill out the form and then, you know, eventually you'll get a call from one of our team members and we connect with you and we try to get you in with the groups. And, you know, we, we want to keep a, a long relationship with everyone because that's important to us, too, to make sure you're fine. If you need it, you know, we've got some people that maybe needed a ride and I took them to their treatment. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of community we're trying to build. I, that, that is great. And, you know, you're, you're very modest about it. But if you go to uh, fightforzero.org, you will see these maps and the maps never existed before. It is a lot of hard work that you and your team have put in to create these maps that give us our first visual understanding of where these clumps are and where these things are so we can start to pose the right questions. What's happening there? Why is that area the same? And why is it that it's, you know, and, and I looked at some of the maps and the areas overlap, you know, from different things you guys have tested for. So there's a fascinating amount of public information that you have on the website that I think is a really great uh, great thing. And, and the map itself, it is, it's so visual that it's easy to look at. And it's something that just never existed until you all put all the work into it to crowdsource and to bring that information together. And I think having that information is something that, you know, it just didn't exist before. And, and having that in adds to the conversation, it adds to the solution, and it adds to the understanding the path to that solution. So it's really incredible. You know, like I said, I know you're modest about it, but I had to read a little bit to everybody about that because yeah. I think it's one of the um, coolest things <laughs> on the website. When I started it in 2014, it was the first thing I ever visioned was mm -hmm. I have to get a visual on this. And so that's, you know, when I start collecting that, that was always my goal. You know, you could talk to people that were there in 2014 and they'll say, 
I was always saying, I want a map. We have to have a map. We have to show the visual of, of what, you know, is going on here. And, and to be honest with you, I only was going to do like where I grew up, like Cocoa Beach or Cocoa right. area. And it ended up being so much bigger than I ever anticipated. <laughs> I, I had people from South Florida that wanted to be included. And, and the one thing that we always say is people, you're more than a number to us. Like you mean so much more to us than just being a number. You know, we know that, you know, sometimes the state will just view you, the government will just look at you as a number, you know, take your number, <laughs> you know, um, or, you know, or just that zip code. And it's so much more to us than that. So um, it's important that we include everybody and, and, you know, we do autoimmune disease too. We're seeing so much thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. and we've talked to specialists about that and, you know, they say it's really difficult to connect even cancer, let alone um, autoimmune disease. But, you know, we're really pushing and we're hoping we can some, make some changes to, to help us in that category. Because I know that we're seeing so much more now than we ever have when it comes to diseases in general. So uh, that's a that's a scary trend. And hopefully, you know, the information that you're collecting will help reverse that trend, you know, that's that's going on. I know. Yeah. A lot of the people that are in the mining areas have also uh, except there's a lot of ALS and um, a lot of other questionable you know um, issues but since the health people tend to avoid going into it they're usually just left with more questions um, you know than, than when they started so that's why I think it's great that your organization has a way to take all that information and plug it in and I think that's the key a lot of people say well, where do I start you know it's there's so much going on um, I saw Camilla made a, a point that after the last time you were on the show and we talked about water testing and water quality, she went ahead and had her water tested and Camilla's in England. Um, so, you know, it's kind of cool because internationally we have uh, a lot going on there. And Camilla, if, if you're still on and want to let us know what your results were, I'd love to know. Uh, I'm really curious. Um, and, uh, you know, Heather says, uh, deliberately adding huge levels way over what is necessary to disinfect. So yeah, they're cleaning the dirty water with more um, poison. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle Fuller says they used to spray glyphosate, which as we know is a big um, big problem. And Heather also brings up that it's in the soil and Jeff brings up it's also in the air. And if you think about it, it is an all out assault. Um, right. You know, but the funny thing is like, people just weren't talking about it 30 years ago. You know I mean? People were focused on certain forms of pollution that they could understand. I mean, like Lake Okeechobee has been yeah, you know, Pete Seeger was giving concerts there. You know, it has been a focal point um, of pollution for a long time. And, uh, but you know, a lot of other aspects are kind of go under the radar. And even when you watch the politicians, they don't really ever discuss, you know, what's happening. And, um, you know, I know the impact in Florida is health and it's also economy, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of people are afraid sometimes to go down there if they hear, if they get misinformation. And that's the big problem too, is a lot of scary misinformation gets um, fed out, you know, when they're not actually handling the, uh, the issues. Um, Heather says, um, well, let's see, Heather. Okay. I just want to, yeah, Molly lawsuits. Um, Heather says the only way to take these is to change, to take frontline legal action. Exactly. There has to be accountability. Jeff says uh, laws need to be changed for that to happen. Exactly. And Don agrees laws changed and new ones made. And, you know, I think that is something that's really important because if we stay focused on laws that are local, then we can change the world internationally. And we also, it doesn't matter who the politicians ultimately and who the presidents and everybody else are. It doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, there's always a, a bunch of different heads. So laws always have a chance of passing. And it really is an important aspect that we can do. We need legal protection back again. Um, mosaics breaking the law and, uh, <laughs> That's uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, this is great. It's good to see so many people in here. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's really fantastic because everybody I see on here, I know fights for clean water. Um, Dawn does have a question. How much firefighting foam have we been contaminated by from KSC and PAFB? Kennedy Space Center and Patrick Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact amount, but there is a restoration advisory board. Um, it's also known RAB. And um, they may have it in your area. You may you know, want to look it up. I know Dawn, so she knows that we have it here. And oh. um, what's interesting is, is they go over all the remediation happening on active installations. It's ran by the Air Force Base. 
Um, so they usually have about four meetings every year. There is so much information. Now, so it, it's information that most people probably won't understand because it's very scientific and detailed. Um, you know, they talk about chemicals and they talk about the remediation actions that they're taking and, and things like that. But um, I try to go to every single one of those meetings because I feel like I learn a lot and there's value in that and learning and what action the Air Force Base and the, you know, FDEP and, and the state is taking to remediate and clean up these contaminants. And I think that's a great thing. I just think, you know, we should we can clean it up all we want, but if we keep dumping it, What's the point in cleaning it up and then dumping it? We don't want to get into that vicious cycle. So I couldn't tell you the exact amount, but yeah, um, I, I would just imagine that there's been a lot that have been dumped, especially because it's in the Indian River Lagoon wildlife. You've got alligators and dolphins that have it. So Wow. Wow. And, you know, there's I know I've seen in Florida, like they had the question mark about why a lot of the panthers were sort of walking around in a daze. Um, and there's a lot of unexplained environmental other catastrophes going on as well, you know, um, and so it is, it's interesting to see. And, you know, I, I thank you guys for keeping track of it and keeping everybody talking about it because it's really important and it's easy for everything to get, you know, thrown to the side. Um, you know, so, and then I've, I've had you on now uh, for a while, but I've, what I want to say is, uh, you know, what, um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to talk, you know, to everybody about or, or tell everybody about through your experience doing this? Well, I think, you know, a lot of people leave not understanding like how they can make a difference. I think everybody's just so overwhelmed with life right now, especially mm. in 2020. Come on, let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, some of the ways that we're really making some impactful changes is just simply educating and bringing awareness to the issues. So, you know, by talking to your neighbor, by talking to your friends about it, um, you know, and educating the pol politicians, whether it's local politicians, state or federal level, your congressman, um, you don't have to be physically out there. Sometimes it's just as simple as writing letters. You know, civic engagement is so important. And I, we lack that in the state of Florida. And so we're really trying to give people the tools to, to be able to do that. We're, we try to encourage civic engagement. And it's one of the things that we um, really, you know, try to arm all of the communities with is, you know, how to contact their local leaders and how to make these changes. And, you know, it, it can be intimidating going to a city council meeting and walking up to that podium and, you know, not knowing how it works or operates, like, you know, that there's an agenda. And if it's not on the agenda item, you have to go talk during public comment, you know. Um, so we're trying to put that that um, knowledge out there and, and making people comfortable and becoming civically engaged. So if you want to make a difference, you know, start writing your legislators, start writing your local politicians. And every time you write them, this is, this is how I look at it. Every time I walk up to that podium and I speak, or every time I write them, I'm putting it on the record. Right. That's really important because now you've uh, kind of written a piece into history. And I look at my two children and I always think if they decide to pick up where I left off, they can look back at all those times that we spoke up at city council meetings mm -hmm. as a reference. You know what I mean? To see, um, you know, what we told them back in, in you know, years ago. I think that's really important because one of the ways we were able to to learn so much is from archived newspapers. So we got to put it on the record and we've got to make it, you know, historical documentation for our future generations, because at the end of the day, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to pick up where we left off. That's that's again, that's exactly it. You know, we leave, leave the world better <laughs> than we found it. And uh, yes, I, I love that. And that is really inspirational. And I really appreciate you being on today, Stella, to talk with us and to come back in. And, you know, it's really important, you know, like I said, not only to, to exactly, not only to show what's happening, but to discuss solutions for it. And if anybody here uh, wants to get in touch with Stella, you can get in touch with her at fightforzero.org. And uh, again, they work internet. Uh, they work nationally with lots and lots of different areas, campaigns. They work all state, all throughout the state. And it's one fantastic place to unify and create one voice to speak up for a better future. So 
Thanks again, Stel, for, for being thank on. You. Thank you for your work. No, thank you for having me, Eric. We appreciate you too and everything you do to bring awareness and, and you know, do these videos. I think it really gives a good platform for all of us. So thanks. Thank well, thanks, you. thanks for being in. <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right. And that was amazing, wasn't it? Um, Stel is an incredible, incredible guest. Uh, Stel is a very inspirational person. And Stel reminds you that, you know, you can make a difference by stepping up in civil engagement in your local towns. Uh, Molly is somebody that does that as well. Molly, uh, oh, Molly, it's actually the number four and then zero spelled out. So it's, uh, here, let me, um, oh, I can't type it up. It's a uh, fight number four. Z oh, thank you, Jeff. I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, and Molly goes to every single meeting to try to discuss what's happening with Mosaic. Molly's very, very active. And that's what's really inspirational about, you know, Stell and and everybody, you know, uh, thank you, Don, as well. And uh, there we go. Everybody's got it on there. Yeah, it's a great website. By the way, you know, we limited our conversation today to just a few of the aspects that Fight for Zero deals with. But I love their concept, you know, let's fight for zero. It's worth fighting for. You know, half of the illnesses that our kids are getting, half the my illness you know, everything that we're seeing happen can be stopped. And if it can be stopped, we have to stop it. There are cancers that cannot be stopped, you know. Um, but if somebody's getting cancer that's genetic, it's going to happen. If somebody gets cancer because they smoke cigarettes, that's their action. But if somebody gets cancer because they bought a house somewhere and they don't know that the river behind them is being polluted legally by, you know, uh, by a major corporation, that is cruel. And it shouldn't be happening. And you know, people like Molly give up their time and their comfort and they go in there. Um, people like Stell, you know, uh, everybody goes out and tries to step in on a local level. And that's what it's all about. Everybody out here can change the world. And some of us can change it from our homes. You know, like Stell said, look, if you can't, you might be working 60 hours a week. You might be raising three kids. You know, I don't know. Like everybody has a different situation. But if you cannot, go to the public meetings. You can still call your senators. You can call, you can sign up. You can stay keeping newsletters with everybody in your local organization. And I've seen amazing local organizations, especially in Florida, change things. You know, here in California, we're very powerless. We feel very powerless. I don't see the same level of, of activism here, quite honestly. Um, so I'm always inspired. And anyway, thank you everybody for joining today. Today was a very, very special show. It was really fun to get to talk to Stell. And, you know, I mean, amazing. You know, here's a cancer survivor that could have, you know, just done anything. Look, when, when you get through your cancer, you feel like you have a second chance at life. Some people spend it uh, having leisure time. Some people spend it, you know, uh, pursuing something they've always wanted to pursue and others decide that they have to put their bodies into the machine and stop it because this is a horrible experience and we don't want anyone to know what we're talking about. Actually, the less people that know what we're talking about, the better. That's our goal. Um, and that's all we want. And we all approach it in a different fashion, but that's what we're trying to do. And Stell and her organization is, in my mind, one of the top ones because they connect health and environment. And these are the two things that the companies tend to keep us focused away from. It's one or the other, right? In America, you talk about your health care or you talk about an MPA, or you talk about an environmental law, but you never talk about the environmental laws that affect your health. Um, so... You know, we have to, we have to bring it up. We have to speak up. And uh, Don, thanks for being on today with us. Thanks, Michelle, Coralie, Molly, Sherry, uh, Andrea, my mom, of course, my mom's here, and Camilla, who always does a lot of activism, always fighting for a better future. Uh, it's a real honor to be here with everybody. It's a real honor to have you guys all on the show with me and to always be supporting this effort and to always be a voice for change and to always be a voice for a better future. So thank you all. It's great to be part of this family. As I always say, it's our world. Let's talk about it. So next week, I will see everybody next Friday um, 
Friday seems to be a pretty good day for everybody. Uh, so we'll try between, you know, Friday and Saturday. But I wanted to thank Stell again and fightforzero.org for being on today. Um, you know, we just really, uh, it, it's inspiring to see somebody out there just, you know, somebody with a mission cannot be stopped. And again, and I never really do this, but I'd like to just end the show with how we began it with the quote that brings Stell and how Stell's inspiration gets into all of us from the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So Dr. Seuss knew that, you know, uh, what, 70 years ago. And, uh, you know, um, some of us learn it in life and others carry that same, same torch, that same flame. And we all fight for that. So it's like I said, it's an honor to be here with everybody as all these eco warriors I see out here, water warriors, land warriors, air warriors. There's a lot of, we got a lot of battle fronts out there, my friends, <laughs> but we can win. We can change it. Nothing is set in stone. They've only ruined our stuff in the last 50 years and we can reverse it. So remember, there's always a solution. There's always a way out. We will find the solution and we will stop all of this poisoning from this legal poisoning from the pollution that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So thanks everybody again. Remember, next time you're out and you're having a great conversation and it goes to the environment and people start to argue about environmental policies, it's a wonderful moment to bring up conversations. It's a great intersection to just say, what about this part of it and to bring that up. And uh, the more we talk about it, the more we can change it. So thanks everybody again for being on the show today. As I always say, it's our world, let's talk about it.